Victoria. So um, I will like to start by thanking all the organizers of this conference. It's been great finally to meet you in person, physically, after two years of um, staying at home, essentially. And of course, all my collaborators. So you'll see many references there, and some of them are here. Carson is here, and Bettina is here. So we have been doing a lot of work together. And all right. So um, I, my talk is uh, divided essentially in two parts, which are not equal in length. The first part will be more about the equilibrium cosmopolitan the, the equilibrium cosmic interaction, and uh, this is some recent work we have done with Bettina. I will not spend too much time uh, on that because you, I hope you had enough time to see her poster. If not, she will be uh, sticking around for a while until the end of the week. So please ask her. And the second part, which will be a bit uh, longer, will be on uh, non-equilibrium cosmic physics, and in particular, will focus on quantum friction. So let's get in. So uh, you have seen already this picture in some of the previous talks. This is great work of uh, um, Stephen Johnson and Mark Levin and uh, all the other guys all in between, of course, too. And uh, this is, uh, to some extent, the first in interesting uh, uh, geometry because uh, it uh, can be seen as the first uh, example of cosmic repulsion because of geometry for objects separated in vacuum. And in this geometry, what is interesting is that the key for this repulsion is an isotropy. So you have been this, uh, you have seen this before. Uh, what I would like, however, to make a kind of publicity for is this other geometry that we were um, working on and with uh, um, Stephen and Alejandro, where the idea was, um, well, in this geometry, you have for sure repulsion, but uh, the uh, repulsion is unstable. You have a settle point at some point. So my guess was, my idea was, so what if we mix geometry with the effect of fluids? And we have seen that fluids can be interesting because without any geometrical modification already in the plate plate configuration, if you choose the right uh, the electric constant, you can get repulsion. So to some extent, fluids transform in, in repulsion what was in attraction. And I was wondering if it was possible with fluids to reverse this potential such that was what was uh, uh, attractive before was repulsive and, and vice versa, and to get something more stable than that. And it turned out that it works. It works actually very well. Uh, again, an isotropy here is, is key, but instead to, be, uh, to have a, a needle here, you have a hockey puck. And of course, you have to use different materials. The, here is a PTFE, don't ask me, it's a very long name to, to, to pronounce it. And uh, uh, the plate is gold with hole, and everything is immersed in water. So in this uh, system, you can show that the cosmic interaction between uh, the hockey puck and, uh, and the plate with a hole leads to a potential which forms a metastable trap here in the middle of the, uh, of the hole. This is actually very interesting, at, at least in my opinion, because you can do a very, in principle, easy experiment. I'm, I'm a poor theoretician, please forgive me for that. Um, where you just uh, dissolve some pocky, pocky pox in water with the plate and uh, just look for the Brownian motion. And if some of them get trapped, then uh, you can see an higher concentration and modification of Brownian motion. And then you can see, you can measure the interaction. And we have seen that there were some experiments along this direction with the, the gold flake. We saw this at the beginning of, of the week. So, um, so the purpose of, of those two uh, uh, examples here is not to tell you essentially also to explain you the physics, but also to tell you that most of this calculation has been done exactly numerically, uh, and uh, uh, they were based on uh, a code which was developed by uh, Stephen and Alejandro, and it was essentially an uh, implementation of DDT, okay? So this has been a great job, get working, and since then they have done, developed the other codes, but this was done with FDDT. So FTDT is very famous in the uh, photonic community. However, it is not the only uh, Maxwell uh, equation solver. There are many of them. And although it's great for a lot of things, it has also some problems. So one of them is that it usually works with structural mesh, which lead to aliasing staircase effect and some problem with the special accuracy. 
And there are other codes which belong to the finite element method uh, codes, which allow to use better uh, other form of uh, meshing, like the uh, unstructured meshing. So one of the most famous, or very useful, or not, not most famous, at least useful, is the so-called uh, discontinuous Galactic time domain method. So this is what, is what Bettina was telling you in their uh, uh, poster presentation. So the, um, the discontinuous Galactic time domain method is very efficient, uh, especially from the point of view of memory. I, I will not uh, give, I will not go too much into detail, but uh, please uh, ask Bettina or ask me if you want to know more about that. So the good thing is that in the group, of we, we, I mean, uh, the Humboldt University, uh, the, our group is also highly specialized in solving numerical, uh, numerically maxed equation. And we had a NAUS code, which was based on discontinuous time galactic, uh, time, uh, and discontinuous galactic time domain method. So we said, great, let's replace FDT with the discontinuous time, time, uh, time domain, the GTD. Can we do a ca a calculations? The answer is yes, and actually works pretty well. This was actually, the lead uh, was taken by uh, Philip Christensen, and uh, we tried to reproduce the results of uh, Stephen uh, Alejandro. And uh, this worked very well. This was, uh, the picture is taken from uh, Bettina's master's thesis. Okay. So uh, the, the approach is very, very e uh, interesting, and it's flexible, highly parallelizable, very efficient because, well, this is a technical detail. It, it can be implemented, you can implement the scatter field formulation and very highly accurate at the nice exponential conversion. So this was great, but we want to do more. Here we did the calculation with the Druda. So what we wanted to do is to push everything even farther and use the flexibility of the code. And so what we thought to do is to introduce no locality. We have seen several talks addressing these aspects and uh, in the customer physics. And uh, uh, numerically, at the moment, there are not too many works, actually, or, to my knowledge, not none of them, working with uh, uh, non-locality. And we asked ourselves, is it possible to implement this uh, in, in our code? The answer is yes. And we did a very baby step, I will say. We used the uh, hydrodynamic model, the hydrodynamic impl implementation of non-locality into our system. So again, this is detailed in, uh, uh, Bettina's poster, which probably is not longer there, but ask us, ask the air for more information. So, um, let me, let me switch gear and to move to the second part of the talk, which uh, again, it will take the, the majority of uh, my time. And, uh, um, let's speak about frictional interaction. Okay. So uh, I, uh, there were some introductions about the frictional interaction in fluctuation uh, in this phenomena. I will give you a different perspective, but we can be uh, seen as equivalent to what was said before. So consider an atom which is moving in vacuum at temperature t equals zero. So the atom, because of Lorentz invariance, will keep its velocity forever which for, to my humble opinion is ama an amazing result because the, uh, the, the, the Lorentz invariance is uh, also uh, working in um, vacuum and in quantum field theory. So it, the atom here is interacting with the, the electromagnetic fluctuation of the quantum vacuum, right? Despite that, it will keep its velocity constant, okay? Because Lorentz invariance says there is no privileged frame here, okay? So now let's consider that uh, the, the system is moving in, uh, in a thermal background. And uh, uh, this, we saw this with uh, what, saying, uh, what, what Kim was saying to us, but there, was all, there were also many works before, that uh, in this case, the atom will feel a frictional force, okay? This is because the black body radiation or the thermal part of black body radiation, not the vacuum fluctuation, will uh, uh, define a privileged frame with respect to which the atom will try to stand to get to rest, okay? So if it was moving before, it will try, it will stop at some point, yeah? So you need at this point uh, a, an external force to keep the velocity constant. So this force here, it's what I and other people in the, in the literature usually call black, black body friction. And it's really connected to the Einstein von Hopp a prediction uh, uh, for uh, uh, of uh, 1910 
something like that. All right, so this is great, and it's a, it has been investigated several times in the literature. Uh, so now let's move a step ahead and put an object in the, in the system, so a plane. So the atom is moving at the constant height above a plane. So you still have a friction, but what is it interesting is that the friction survive when the temperature is going to zero, right? So this is meaning that you're shifting your attention, your focus from the thermal fluctuation to the vacuum, the quantum fluctuation. That's why I usually call this uh, quantum friction, okay? So what is defining the privileged frame in this case? Well, it, uh, you can show that because of dispersion, dispersion in the material, it's the near field which is setting the, the privilege frame. And this, uh, the interaction, will generate this frictional force. This is equivalent to what also Fernando was saying before, when you have the interaction between the dipole and uh, uh, the image dipole. And the important thing, in all this system, everything is neutral. Neutral and non-magnetic. Okay? All right. Um, so, in the next of my talk, I will be focusing essentially on quantum friction. So, this is an underwaving argument to tell you that there is a force, but getting a description of this force has been problematic in the past. So, there were very, a lot of, collect, a collection of results, which were, uh, you know, some of them were in the 80s, and uh, were dif uh, having a different behavior as a function of the, a functional dependence on the velocity and on the distance from the surface. And even when the velocity and the distance of the surface were agreeing, the prefactors were often very different, okay? So um, we started to look at these things and we tried to understand a lot of, uh, you know, we, we understood, that, I believe that we understood a lot of uh, interesting uh, things. And uh, uh, everything is really depending on how you're calculating and which kind of approximation you are doing, okay? So let me describe one of them. And uh, we have heard also about it in the, um, in the talk of uh, Professor Wang uh, before uh, lunch. So one of the most common uh, approximation in non-equilibrium physics is uh, the local thermal equilibrium approximation. So what you generally do, you take your system, in our case the atom and the surface, and you, you uh, subdivide it into two uh, regions in this case, and you assume that for each of them you have equilibrium. So that with that, you can use equilibrium uh, results, right? And in particular, fluctuation distribution theorem. And then you mix everything in order to get the, the, the interaction you're looking for, okay? So of course, this is an approximation which uh, can, works very well in most of the cases, but you are not certain that it works because usually you do not compare with an exact result, okay? Um, our approach is different. And our approach will be uh, looking at the behavior of the total system and self-consistently treating the non-equilibrium steady state. Okay? So to some extent, we consider the whole thing together without making a local thermal equilibrium approximation. So um, I will not have the time to tell you how we did it. Uh, it's a bit complicated. We can chat later. You can ask me later. Uh, but let me just show you what we, we get. So we look at the low velocity limit, uh, everything is at zero temperature, and we found this expression for uh, the frictional interaction. So this, the force, the frictional force for an atom moving above the surface is proportional to the static polarizability of the atom. A parameter rho, which is describing uh, the behavior of the density of states of the electromagnetic field at low frequency. And for your understanding, for conductors, this is essentially the resistivity of the material. And uh, the force is scaling at the third power of the velocity, so it's kind of anomalous friction. It's not linear in the velocity. And in the case of a local and homogeneous material, you have this very strong distance dependence, which to some extent is confirming that the friction is a near field effect. Okay? So with this expression, we can compare this result to the result you will get for the local thermal equilibrium approximation in order to get a, a contrast, right? So what we did is we brought the force as a contribution, which was the one that we will, will have gotten in the, in the framework of the local thermal equilibrium approximation and the correction, which is proportion, which is due to non-equilibrium if you want to. And when we compared the two, it turned out that the two were almost 
uh, the same level. So this local thermal equilibrium approximation that is very used, uh, often used in particular in fluctuation electrodynamics, in this case, does not work at all. So the implicit assumption about the no local thermal equilibrium approximation is that the local, the non-equilibrium correction are small. And here you have that this far, uh, uh, not exactly, not this case. Actually, uh, the force has two contributions which are almost equal. All right, this was interesting because leads to a failure of this very common, commonly used, at least in this case, this very commonly used approximation in non-equilibrium physics. All right, so uh, it, we wanted also to move things forward and we wanted to say, okay, let's think on uh, well, learning the physics, allow, let, let's, how, uh, let's see how we can uh, measure the force. And for that, we had to make some estimation. As, as Ricardo was saying, we were very disappointed because the friction of force or, or acceleration, if you divide it by the time, of, by, the, by the mass of the atom, is very weak. Yeah? It's uh, orders of magnitude smaller than the cosmic polar interaction, which is already small, right? So, uh, one, in order to understand, uh, uh, you know, if you understand what we told us, okay, let's try to understand the physics, because if you understand the physics, you might find ways of uh, um, increase the strength of the interaction. And so the first uh, idea we, uh, we had is, okay, we have this framework, which is self-consistent. Let's uh, leverage uh, uh, on the uh, material properties of the system, yeah, the plate. And since we are looking at the near field, the f one of the first things that you have to think about when you work in the near field is that the local description of a material in the near field, especially for a conductor, might be wrong. Okay, so what we did, we moved into a non-local description and we used the model, which is the linear mermin model, which is uh, very common in uh, condensed matter physics, where you're describing your metal as a Fermi fluid. And uh, uh, by implementing this in our calculation, we compare this result to the result we will have gotten from the Drude model. And this, what, this is what I'm plotting here. This is the ratio between uh, the uh, um, uh, Drude model, in particular the LTE approximation. This is what uh, it has been done uh, previously in the literature and our calculation. So what is interesting here is that the force of large separation, the two models uh, agree. Here the difference does not go to zero because of the two what I was telling you before, because of the non-equilibrium correction. However, when you go at distances which are small with respect to the characteristic uh, uh, electron mean free path for gold is 50 nanometers, uh, then the frictional force increase remarkably of about uh, a few orders of magnitude. So we were trying to understand what was going on there. And uh, we understood that in this case, another dissipative channel uh, which is contributing to some extent to the resistivity I was showing before, enters in the system. And this channel is the Landau damping. So you have an additional phenomenon of dissipation, which is characterizing it essentially in the, always in the near field, because you have to have grazing incidents in order to have a very strong Landau damping, that is uh, contributing to enhancing, so enhancing the force by increasing the dissipative properties of your system. So this is, was nice because we had already a couple of order managers more with respect to what we were calculating before. So we also proceeded to co a comparison between the local thermal equilibrium approximation and the total calculation. And then we got that the, the ratio, the non-equilibrium correction was even stronger, okay? So you really have to pay attention with this kind of things in order to do the right calculation and make the right prediction. All right, another way to manipulate the interaction and by manipulating the material, it's not using giving better description or changing the material. You can increase the resistivity by considering, for example, doping, uh, se uh, 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 doped semiconductors. This will increase the, the resistivity a lot, okay? But there is other ways, there are other ways, which are less trivial, and one of them is nanostructuring. So we consider a multilayer here, and uh, in this multilayer, because of the interaction between the charge of those layers, there are new modes, so the spectrum uh, is, is modified, okay? This also modifies uh, the uh, near field of, uh, of the plate of this multilayer, and therefore the friction. 
And the, and the modification is interesting uh, uh, in two ways. First of all, you have a change of the power law dependence. Here we plot the force with respect, with respect to the bulk. So here you have a very short separation, the force is behaving as bulk, but as you increase the separation with respect to the, the, uh, the uh, thickness of this layer, the behavior of the force, the power law will change. It will go from 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 8. This is because the uh, atom is seeing essentially the first layer of this multi-layer system. Okay, this is where we are now. So already with a multi, with just one layer, if we compare this also with one slab. This is the the result here. Uh, is uh, you get an increase with respect to the bulk. Okay, then you increase you then you increase even farther the distance, and then the power law will change again. It will go to ten to the minus nine, nine, right? Which is worse than this one, but uh, it, the increase of, of the interaction, this is of course is the relative increase, uh, is still bigger, okay? Then the, the, the force is bigger than the counterpart for the bulk. So there is another interesting phenomenon in the case of a multilayer. So if you do the calculation with the so-called effective medium calculation, you will realize that this multilayer has a region which is uh, sub-ohmic. -sub so it's not becoming, behaving as an ohmic material, but it's behaving as like a sub-ohmic material. And the V to the third behavior of the force was related to the ohmic property of the, of the material. So if you change it from ohmic to sub-ohmic, you should expect also change in the, in the velocity dependence. And this is exactly what we see here. Here, this is what we will have for a bulk, and this is the behavior of the force uh, at, uh, at larger velocity. For reasons that are too long to explain, this behavior, this change uh, occurs uh, starting from uh, a certain velocity, and at low velocity, we always recover at the V to the third behavior, at least at T equals zero. All right, so uh, this is essentially what I want to tell you for this slide. Let's move ahead. Uh, another way to increase the interaction is uh, to, to do this, this reasoning. Okay, I have, uh, it's a kind of classical reasoning. So I have an atom which is moving against, uh, near to the surface. And also when you have, for example, your brakes in your car, your, uh, your, you try to brake from both, both sides, one side and the other side, because you make friction on one side and the other side. So if you increase the number of objects in, around the atom, you might expect already that your frictional interaction will increase. And then your first naive intuition will be that the friction will be uh, additive, and then you have to sum the friction between this atom in the body one, this atom in body two, and so on and so forth, right? And if you use the right symmetry, then you get an increase of a factor n with respect to the friction that you have uh, with one body. So um, this, unfortunately, is wrong, or would say, I should say, fortunately, because if you do the calculation within within our approach. This is what you get, an increase on uh, proportional to n square. So it's the frictional force is highly non-additive, and uh, this non-additivity can in be interesting also for experiments. Right? Uh, I will not have time to explain you what this this prefactor here, but this is a prefactor of the order of three or four, which has also a nice, interesting interpretation. But uh, unfortunately, I will not have the time. Please ask if you are interested. All right, let me just give an example. So this is an atom moving above a surface, and we do compare the same thing with an atom moving above it within a cavity. So from the frictional from an additive perspective, we will have that the frictional force will be twice the uh, force of one surface. So we did a calculation for this cavity. This is possible, uh, also analytically. And this is the result. If the atom is moving in the middle, the force is increased of a factor 17 with respect to the surface. Right? So this is already one other order of magnitude that you have uh, to your frictional interaction. Right? So this result is at zero temperature. And uh, we did the same calculation at non-zero temperature. And uh, it, it kind of robust. It becomes a bit less, um, but it's, it's also uh, stronger. So think about uh, finite temperature. 
um, it, it is always interesting to consider to think to get as near as possible to the experimental system. And the experiments are difficult, especially for friction, are difficult to be considered at zero temperature. There will always be some temperature. So we did the calculation for uh, finite temperature, and what we obtained is something also rather interesting, in my opinion. Uh, this is the plot of the frictional force with respect uh, to the velocity. And as you see here, you have two regimes. One where the force is behaving as uh, linear in the velocity with this uh, power law. But then when the velocity starts to become larger than the critical velocity, the quantum behavior which we saw before is recovered. Okay? So surprisingly, at least this was surprising to me, when you have a system that becomes, where the, energy, the kinetic energy of the system becomes larger and larger, the system becomes quantum and quantum, quantum or more quantum, more and more quantum. Okay? So you recover the contribution of the, the quantum fluctuation. So there is a nice explanation for that. Here you have that in this regime, the uh, quantum fluctuations are the one, uh, sorry, the thermal fluctuations are the one which are dominating the interaction. And here what you have is the quantum fluctuation are the number of, the, the interaction of a quantum fluctuation becomes dominant and then the, uh, the force becomes essentially quantum, okay? All right, let me just give you another perspective, I mean, a sneak peek about this result. You can have also uh, analyzed the same result from a point of view of the distance. So this is the force, how it behaves at the low velocity and the scaling as uh, uh, t squared. Uh, uh, so this, we are in the thermal regime. And then you have that the force here is increasing at the you have uh, corresponding to uh, this critical velocity, also critical distance, where you have that the force will go from the quantum frictional regime, a short separation, to the more classical or term, I would say thermal, uh, it's not classic at all, a thermal regime at higher separation. So you, if you want to get quantum, go nearer or get, get faster. All right, so um, this concludes more or less what I want to tell you about the results. There is more, but I certainly will not have the time. Let me just uh, give you two slides about experiments because this is, in my opinion, important. Physics is, at the end of the day, an experimental uh, discipline. So you can do all the theory that you want, but if you don't have an experiment, you're just doing maths. So um, you have seen already this experiment of uh, this nice proposal of Fernando and uh, uh, Ricardo. This is great in my opinion. And uh, so uh, this is some estimation about the friction acceleration on a lithium atom with, this, with these properties. So this is great. So another idea I was having about this, this top is the, whether you can use also this in combination with atom interferometry. So um, you just put atoms and you try to do atom interferometry, uh, which unfortunately atoms in atom interferometry are moving of the order of uh, meter per second. So it's very, very slow. But if you have the surface here, you can make an arm of the interferometer near to the surface, which is rotating an arm which is far away. Okay? So you can do atom interferometry, which has an accuracy, which is already of the order of this, this quantity. So another proposal, which I was also discussing with uh, uh, Gabriel, and uh, this uh, made my, using the matter wave diffraction. This is more or less the, the scheme of the experiment that he presented also. Uh, so this is something I was thinking since a while, you know, we're thinking about it since a while. And the idea is that uh, in this setup, already by default, the atoms are going really, really fast. So you can have also up to 100 kilometers per second. And by construction, the grating as the form of a cavity, as the cavity I was presenting you, where the size, the distance, this is taken from a paper of Marcus Sand, was already for 45 nanometers. So in the middle, you have that the, great, the atom will be at, the, at the, a shorter distance of 22 nanometers from the surface, okay? And the idea is to see whether you can measure some, uh, or you can see some effects of this frictional interaction interference pattern. So we are working on that. We are still, uh, uh, there's some work ongoing. Uh, it, of course, the theory prediction can be one. The experiment is, can be difficult uh, because uh, these experiments are usually are noisy, but we saw that uh, Gabriele is actually working very uh, hard on that and increase the precision. It's actually very good. 
All right, so uh, this is essentially the same uh, picture he was showing in his talk, and uh, it's just to tell you that this was used in order to measure the Kasimir-Polder interaction, or the, the, the Van der Waals kasimir polder interaction. All right, so let me come to my conclusion. Um, so um, I was able to show you that uh, the, in equilibrium physics we are suggesting an alternative approach to the already great approach based on FDT for the numerical calculation of the Casimir interaction with complex geometry. And we are pushing a bit forward uh, um, uh, by including material properties like, such as non-locality into the description. Um, on the non-equilibrium side, I was, I, hope, I, mean, I, thought, I think that you were already halfway convinced that uh, the electromagnetic vacuum behaves like a viscous medium. And uh, um, in particular, uh, the, uh, the, the particle moving above a surface will feel a frictional force. Um, so in the non-equilibrium steady state, the frictional force can have a stronger non-equilibrium contribution, which was actually um, basically ignored before, and that the interaction can be uh, tuned by leveraging uh, on the material properties and on the nanostructure of the system. Uh, the frictional force is stronger in non-additive. This is what, so, non-additivity, we are used to it in the Casimir physics, but not as strong as the one that we, we saw in the frictional force. We are speaking about some percent, in, usually, in Casimir physics. Here we are speaking about 100%, 200%, 1,000%, depending on the body, uh, number of bodies you have around the, the head. And then, at finite temperature, uh, the frictional force changes behavior and is characterized by critical velocity and uh, critical distance, depending upon from which side you're uh, looking at it. So with that, I want to conclude, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Francesco. Let's start uh, with some questions. Thank you, Francesco, for the talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, this uh, idea of having a signature of quantum friction in the atom interferon in, the, in this uh, uh, experiment with the transmission grating, right, in, in yes. matter, the matter wave experiment. Yes. I mean, you would expect a, a decrease in visibility, right? Correct. It's a dissipative effect, Correct. so uh, Correct. it's not a, a shift Correct. in it's the frame. It's not a shift. What we expect is the reduction of contrast of uh, the frames. Okay. Uh, of course, this is depends, it would be proportional on the velocity and so on. And uh, what we also expect is that uh, there might be, uh, as uh, Gabriel was showing, there would be something connected also with the integration due to the, uh, the slit that you have. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other question is this problem with uh, the atom going, this non-additivity, right, when you have two surfaces. And we can think of this as a kind of open cavity too, right? So Correct. is there any uh, resonance condition that you can try no. to, to increase? Okay, enhance? so this is a, a very good question. Um, so it turns out, so you're referring me to this. All right, so um, friction uh, has usually two components, one which is a non-resonant component, and uh, the, which is mostly the one we, we are uh, considering here. The other one is a resonant one, which is occurring when you, have res you are matching energetically the resonance of the system. So it turns out that in most of the configuration, the resonance that you are considering are too far above in order to be matched by uh, the uh, mechanical energy that you are imp inputting in the system. So yet these calculations, uh, most of the calculations that we have done, we, are not, we were not be able, to, well, we were not considering the resonant interaction. You can certainly um, get to the resonant part if you find the right material, uh, with the right resonances, and then you have some resonance effect also in this cavity. But in this specific case, which were basically uh, dual material metal, uh, the resonance were far above the, um, uh, we should go ultra relativistic or very, very high velocity, you know? And the formalism is at the moment is uh, not relativistic. So in this case, there are no resonance condition at this. What about the internal degrees of freedom of the atom? You so here, uh, uh, we are in the optical regime. Also for the atom, we consider rubidium. So this will correspond to velocity, me me the mechanical energy that you have to input will correspond to velocity, which is of the order of 0. Uh, uh, 0 0.05, the speed of light, which is difficult to achieve in the usual experiment. So. Again, we, we decided not, we, we have the, we can do the full plot, the theory works, of course, but we decided to focus more on the, what was experimentally more relevant. Yes. Yeah. 
you first. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, Francesco, very nice talk. Um, uh, just a quick question about in the beginning when you talk about DGTD, uh, I guess in one of your slides you mentioned the convergence is, is exponential. Yep. Uh, what do you mean by uh, an exponential convergence? So it depends on the polynomial order uh, that we are using in order to um, describe using to to describe the code. Here I was saying this here. So. Um, um, so what you do is that you uh, d d discretize your system and then you use, depends on the basis that you use, and you use the f f uh, different uh, Legendre polynomials with a different order. So what you have is that the order of the polynomials that you are setting will determine the convergence, how good, how, how fast, how good is your convergence. So this exponent in the, po in the, in the, in the, in the polynom uh, will uh, set, will get, the higher is the exponent, the better, the faster we'll, uh, we'll, we, we'll, you will converge to the right result. Uh, but that's an exponential dependency on the order of the polynomial? Yes. Francesco, uh, very nice talk. Couple of questions. So first is uh, the V cube dependence. You mentioned that has to do with the ohmic spectral density. How can one understand that like physically, uh, one question. The other is, have you considered the case of n atoms uh, instead of n surfaces, and is the scaling still n square in that case? All right. Uh, so uh, for the ohmic dependence, it's going to get a bit, a bit strange. So the, the best way of seeing it, uh, I will say, is that uh, you have to integrate. Uh, at the end of the day, what you, you will have is you have to integrate your reflection coefficient, which will be also proportional to the frequency if the material is somic. So your, the imaginary part of the reflection coefficient will grow as with the, with the, with the mm -hmm. frequency uh, between uh, a, um, a range which is uh, given by zero and the velocity of the red. So if the power law will change, then uh, you will have uh, um, uh, a change also in the, in the behavior. So it's actually more complicated than that because you have the frequency of the atom times another frequency. So you have omega squared that you have to multi integrate from zero to V, and then you get the V to the third behavior. If you have uh, um, a subomic material, which is going as square root, as in the case of the multilayer, you have a square root of omega times square root of omega. So it's going, uh, it's, it's scaling as omega, which you have to integrate from zero to V, and then you have the quadratic behavior, okay? So this will be uh, my end waving way of explaining why this is, this is behaving this way. So concerning the atom, it's certainly uh, interesting. The question is, um, uh, so in the calculation that we are doing, uh, uh, we need an extended body for interaction. So uh, some calculation with atoms was done, were done by Barton in 2010. And then we was considering just one atom moving next to an atom. So you have a very short interaction. So experimentally, it's not interesting, or at least for, for it's difficult to say, let's say. Uh, for more atoms, if you set a lot of atoms, one after the other, this, I don't know. I mean, it could be certainly interesting uh, uh, because you can have collective effects in this case. I think it's off, Kim. Okay. Oh, uh, I had a question about uh, the temperature dependence. So on the slide you had before with the... Yes. Uh, where are you? Okay. Sorry, here. Uh, yes, and before that... Yes. You said uh, where you had the enhanced, uh, the, where you went from... Right, 17, and then, okay, so yes. you say T not zero, well, what T was it? Uh, was the, the temperature of the system, the total? No, uh, no, the, no, the, you say not zero, I mean, ah, it doesn't discontinue. So, so, yes, at the end of the day, what we compared is uh, the, the temperature of, uh, uh, so what happens is the, the following. So you have, in addition to this V to the third part, you have this V, uh, proportional to V terms, and this term, is arising from only from this term, V to the third. Oh, that's when you've gone into the... You get, uh, exactly, this is okay. why yeah, it's so changing the coefficient. Got it. Uh, you're very Good question for you. In, the, uh, in this geometry here, 
Um, to measure quantum friction, uh, you need to keep the uh, distance from the surface constant, and you need to control that. How are you going to do that? So here, this is a, a, an excellent question. So the, the point is, of course, the, the strongest is in the middle of the cavity. So, uh, and then if you think about the experiment that uh, uh, Gabriel was is speaking about, so what you have is that uh, the, the atoms are going through this grating, and only the one we got through the middle will be slightly deflected because the other will be absorbed by the surface, will go down, right? So the dominant, the, the, the amount of atoms which are going out are already located around the middle of but the But not structure. all of them will be absorbed. I mean, well, this is not what... some degree of probability they will be absorbed. Some sure, sure. Of course, you have a stronger reduction of the signal when you go from one side to the other side of the grid. And this is exactly what uh, uh, Gabriel was saying, right? And uh, uh, this will also modify uh, the, the, the characterize the strength of the interference button. But when you get out, the, the number of atoms that will get out from the grid are the, are the ones which are located in the middle of, uh, or most likely located in the middle of, 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 the, of, this, uh, of this trench, right? So by default, just because you are doing this experiment and you are measuring something, the majority of the atoms that you will be getting at, in your screen are the one that went in the middle of the trench, right? Which were not deflected, right? Of course, you can engineer other techniques in order to do this. So, for example, there was some work of uh, Philip Russell uh, in Erlangen, where you combine also lasers in order to uh, keep things... Uh, Another way to do it is what uh, Ricardo is doing. You place the atom uh, and then rotate... So, the this, this could also work, of course. <laughs> but uh, you, then, then you... Yeah, sure. Uh, Francesca, very nice. Uh, quick question. I want to follow up on what Paolo said. So, in this experiment, it'll cause a uh, decrease in the, um, the height of the uh, fringes. But how about if you made this periodic, the size of the cavity, you know, every two cavities, it changes, um, the length of the cavity changes. So then you might get a beat, uh, potentially, or how about if you put a size of the cavity changes regularly, like a triangle or, like, you know. Yeah. So this way the wings of this diffraction pattern are modified because of your friction. Yes, yeah, yeah, this is actually a good idea. So you can see there are other form of grating in order to, mod to get something less trivial. Yes. This can certainly be interesting, but this will, I, I, I honestly don't know. And I, I think that this could be also very interesting, an interesting suggestion for the measurement of the cosmic polar. So you have a modulation of the yeah. grating, you can have yeah. something. Yeah. yeah, you can just so you can probably, and this is actually why at the end of the day it's good to have some numerics with you. Uh, is that you can make some inverse design in order to, or some optimization, and Bettina is also good with that, uh, in order to uh, find the best geometry in order to enhance your signal. Yes. Okay, another very last question. Okay, so uh, we certainly have many things to discuss, but I want just to ask you here, instead of slits, what would happen if it's be a cylinder? Huh. This is actually very interesting. We have done the calculation I wanted not to speak on. So here it is even stronger. The non-additivity is even stronger. Yes. Because yeah. in a clean room, yeah. or it's we are fin we are, to... we are finished a work also on that. Yeah. It's off. Okay, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I, I think in, the, in order to have a, a huge signal or, or, or more signal about friction, you need increase the longitudinal section of this grating, no? If not, the, this uh, re reduction of the pattern, pattern fringes yeah. can be explained just by the decoherence yeah. due to the scattering with the air molecules. Yes. Like a sailing air experiment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and do you have any idea of, of the law? Could so, be. So, uh, it, it, uh, uh, this is a very good question indeed. So, of course, the experiment must be done with care. I've, I was already speaking with uh, some experimentalists. We are doing uh, in the group of Marcus Sound. 
and are doing experiments toward this direction, and they told me that uh, in principle there are setups where you can have some centimeter long wave drives. And uh, um, they have done, uh, there have been already measurements for atoms flying uh, through these things. Whether this measure, this is what he was telling me, and I saw the, the paper too. Uh, I don't remember at the moment where, uh, whether these measurements were for uh, interference pattern, of course. Okay, very, very quick question, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I don't remember what kind of atom this was, but I was wondering, um, do you know how much um, uh, reduction in the velocity you get by going through a certain length of grading? And the reason I'm wondering is if, uh, if you lose enough, then could you do something where um, you're treating this kind of like ion implantation and there's some way of measuring the kind of kinetic energy that it has at the end and see if it's been reduced as well? Yes, so, so I, we, we, again, we are doing the work, uh, so we are still at the beginning. Um, I hope that we'll be able to tell you something. Of course, this depends on the material, right? The, the, the stronger is, for example, the, the resistivity of the material, the stronger is the interaction, the, the faster you will lose velocity, right? So I cannot give you a number for that. Um, but uh, uh, this is definitely highly tunable because uh, you can, uh, for example, use uh, material which are, have, uh, adopt, as I was saying before, adopt semiconductors uh, which have uh, high resistivity and this with this high resistivity you can, to some extent, and then, as, as, I mean, when I say this, is based on the simple model description of the, super, uh, of the semiconductors. Of course, as we saw before, you have to do the right physics in order to do the right prediction. Otherwise, you get probably the functional dependence, but you get the, the, the order magnitude is completely wrong. So um, we did some estimation, and the force can be larger, quite larger. And on top of that, you know, you have the uh, finite thickness of the layer there, which can also play a role. So uh, long story short, I cannot give you a number, but uh, there is a large uh, amount of tunability in the, in the, in the setup. So, well, yeah, we, I don't know if you can stop the atom, but I, I don't believe so. Uh, but you might be able to reduce uh, the, the velocity substantially, and then you do something. You can do something similar. Um, uh, yeah, then you can then try to do a measurement, a bit like you were saying. Thanks. Yes, thanks again, the speaker.